Welcome to the Foundations of Simple IDK portion of the tutorial. In this part, we will go over the two key elements of Simple IDK, transforms and images, and combine the two to perform image resampling. At this point, you are expected to have completed the tutorial installation. If you have not done so, please go to the tutorial website and follow the instructions provided there. We'll start by checking that the installation was successful and opening the setup notebook, which I already have done. If you're new to Jupyter Notebooks, please go to the Jupyter uh, Project documentation and read how to work with Jupyter Notebooks. As a convenience uh, with working with Jupyter Notebooks, they usually do not occupy 100% of the screen width. You can either set your defaults to do that or set it per notebook. The instructions are given here. We'll start by checking that your installation of Simple ITK is with the required version. In our case, we're looking for version 2.0. And as you can see, I'm still working with release candidate 2 because this tutorial is being recorded prior to our official release of uh, Simple ITK 2.0. The next thing is we will check that your uh, in, uh, external viewer program is installed correctly in the expected location. And our default program is Fiji. If you want to work with another external viewer, that's also possible. I'll show you how to do that shortly. Let's just see that Fiji is able to read and we're able to second. We can see that it's open here and and if you prefer another image viewer, for instance, in our case, in my case, I have ITK Snap installed. I can tell the image viewer to set application and give it the path to that desired application. And let's see that that works. And ITK Snap, ITK Snap cannot display uh, RGB images, so it's displaying the lo uh, simple ITK uh, old logo in black and white. See that uh, uh, IPy widgets are installed correctly and that we can interact with them. You can see the number is changing when, the, when I change the slider location. And finally, you'll need to get all the data that is used uh, during this tutorial. And that's, we run this fetch data all command and you saw this was instantaneous because I've already run this command previously. You'll see a progress uh, reported here per download. And once the data is downloaded, uh, the fetch data is smart enough to see that it's downloaded, no need to re-download it. And at the bottom of every notebook in this tutorial, you'll see a next button which will guide you to the, obviously, next notebook in the series. So we're about to start our journey and we're starting with spatial transformations. Some uh, important things to note, points in simple ITK are represented by vector-like data types. So in Python, those are tuples, numpy, arrays, lists, and so forth. Matrices are represented by vector-like data types just in row major order, uh, similar to the numpy ravel. Uh, command if you're familiar with that. Uh, default transformation initialization, when you create a new uh, transformation, it's initialized to the identity transform. Angles are in radians. Distances are in unknown units because uh, ITK and simple ITK are unitless, but the readers often uh, convert from whatever units the uh, images were in to millimeters. So you need to pay attention to that. So if you're working in the microscopy world or you're working in nanometers, you do not want your uh, the numbers in simple ITK to be 0, 0.000 something. So uh, because that is not com will lead to unstable computations. So you might want to uh, deal with that explicitly so that there is no conversion to millimeters. Uh, all global transformations except translation are of the form A. Here we have the center around which we want the transform, the rotate rotations in the transform to happen. And we've got the tran uh, standard translation. And again, we're dealing with centered transforms. Uh, in ITK speak, we refer, when we say matrix, we mean the matrix A, center C. 
translation is the vector t and offset is this more complicated uh, combination here. Uh, in addition to these global transforms, we have bounded transformations that are the B-spline transform and displacement transform. Outside of their local domain, they uh, uh, are uh, the identity transform. Uh, the displacement field transform, an important aspect is that uh, it's memory intensive and also the uh, pixel type of that transform is a vector float 64. So we're trying to be have a precision here, but it's at a cost of memory. Initialization of a displacement field. Once you give an image to the displacement field transform, it consumes it and the image is zeroed out because it's so memory intensive. We don't want to keep multiple copies of the data. And composite transforms are a, a, a type of transform, you, convenience transform that allows us to combine multiple transformations uh, in a stack-based semantics where the uh, first added is last applied to the points. So our explicit transformation types, we have translation transform and you select if it's 2D or 3D. Verser, which is unit quaternion, which is a 3D, represents 3D rotation and, uh, and that's it. Uh, Verser rigid, Again, this is rotation and translation. Euler in 2D, Euler in 3D, similarity in 2D, similarity in 3D, scale transform, and then you have to specify what dimensionality. Is it 2D or 3D? Uh, scale verser and scale skew verser are somewhat unique. You will likely not use them because they are not what you expect them to be. More about that later. Affine, again, you need to select if you're working in 2D or 3D. B-spline, same thing, 2D or 3D. Displacement field, composite transform, and transform is the generic parent superclass for all these transforms. So let's start by uh, looking at this code. We uh, import, obviously, SimpleIDK, uh, some utility functions that we've written and uh, plotting and the widgets. Additionally, in a, for uh, this is good programming practice, we do not want our output to go to the same directory where our code sits, where our notebooks live. So we have an output directory defined here and everything will go there. So let's run this cell and again, uh, some background on general transformations. We'll start with a dimension two transformation here, and we'll start with a translation. This is a regular uh, a Python approach to uh, creating a list that has the entry two, and then I repeat that entry multiple times. In this case, the dimension is two, and we have a 2D translation. So what happens if I change the dimension? Let's change it to four and see what happens and oh we got an exception and what does it say invalid dimension for transform which makes sense given that we only support 2d and 3d transformations let's see if i set it to three what happens and you can see that i have a translation transform and the uh, transform is two 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 because this is repeated three times now so now that we've got our, uh, let me return back here, run it again, set the dimension to two, run it, and we run the transformation. We create a point 10, 11, and apply the translation to that. And we're getting uh, the transformed point is just plus two in each coordinate, which is what we expect and all our transformations have get inverse all our global excuse me uh, transformation have a get inverse method and that just gives the inverse transformation and if we apply that to the point that we transformed we get it back so we have 10 11 again now let's look at the euler 2d transform it's param parameterized by a single angle that is given in radians and again, we have a, a 
we can set the translation, set the angle, here it's uh, set and just apply the transform and if you do the computations manually you'll see that you get the expected result. Not, nothing very exciting happening here. Now with uh, the Verster uh, 3D which is a, a unit quaternion representation of rotation we can set it in a variety of, initialize it in a variety of ways one is give the actual verser, which is the uh, vector component, and then the scalar component of the unit quaternion. Or we can use an axis angle notation where we give the axis of rotation and the angle. All of these are equivalent. Or we can use a rotation matrix. And as we said earlier, matrices in simple IDK are represented by a vector which is un unraveling in row major order of the matrix. So this would be minus one zero zero is the first row of a, our matrix. And we have a point here and what's interesting here is that if you look even with this basic just setting the value these are all, all of these settings are com converted to a single type of setting for the rotation representation and even these simple conversions already introduce some uh, numerical uh, d differences. Again, we're working on a computer. That's to be expected, but uh, be aware of it. So we're going on with uh, going to translation to rigid. We're essentially moving in the uh, within the uh, global transformations from uh, transformations from with fewer parameters to more and more uh, complex transformations with more and more parameters. So we're moving from a translation to a rigid transformation. And we'll just see what are the differences. And this just shows you how do I move from one parameter space to the other. And as you can see, the differences are zero. This utility function essentially generates a random set of points, applies the two transformations to them, and checks what is the distance between the uh, map point mappings. And uh, looks at the max, mean, and standard deviation. Uh, given that this is over a global domain, this doesn't mean guarantee, excuse me, this doesn't guarantee that the two transformations are equivalent, but they are equi equivalent in the, uh, for the set of points that we checked. Okay, so moving from rotation to uh, rigid, we copy the matrix or verser and the center of rotation. If we don't uh, copy the center, let's see what happens, because right now it's uh, commented out and we can see that these two transformations are not equivalent when we did not copy the center uh, from the uh, rotation transformation. Now that we've copied it, these really represent the exact same transformation. One is over-parameterized, uh, but again, this is the same transformation. Okay, now let's look at similarity. The interesting thing with uh, using uh, uh, centered transformations is that sometimes uh, they don't behave, behave exactly as you would expect when you change scaling for a similarity transform. You would just expect things to change their scale. But uh, this is actually what is happening. So we get a, a, the results in a scale plus translation when we're uh, changing the uh, center of uh, the uh, transformation. So let's look at this and we can play with the, the uh, as you can see, we're just changing the uh, center of the transform. We're not actually changing any uh, of the other, the standard parameters. So uh, this might surprise some people. So let's continue. We move on to from rigid to similarity in 3D. Again, just copying the parameters in and uh, the rest using uh, the uh, default values. So we're over-parameterizing when we move from a 
rigid to similarity in th uh, 3D. And we can see that this uh, results in correct uh, creation of the new uh, transformation. Now we move from similarity to affine. You need to copy the translation, center, and matrix, and that's all that is required. So again, in this case, we just create a similarity, transformation, axis angle, translation, scale factor, and when the way to copy it is just so you get the matrix from the similarity transform, you get the translation, you get the center, and your set, your affine transformation is uh, good to go. Uh, scale transform, again, just similar to what we had uh, with uh, the uh, similarity. There is unintended effect because of the uh, center, centered transform. This is non-isotropic scaling, unlike the similarity. So you can see we're changing this. And yes, we have scale, but when we're changing the center of uh, the matrix, we have an effect that looks like translation. A couple of unintended misnomers uh, originally from ITK, and those are embedded in the toolkit. But scale versor, it's not a composition of scale and rigid uh, rotation. It's some uh, strange addition of them. Scale skew versor, again, not a, not a composition, but adding the matrices here. Uh, you might find use for these, but uh, these are a bit... Uh, they are what we call historical remnants from ITK, but they're available in Sumpa ITK. Now that we've covered all of the uh, uh, global, global domain transformations, we move over to uh, bounded transformations. And Sumpa ITK supports two types. One is B-spline transform, that is a sparse representation of deformation, and displacement tra field transform, which is a dense representation of a, a non-rigid transformation. A B-spline, again, is defined by a set of control points and the parameters uh, that uh, are set to position those control points are given in a, a raveled, uh, in a flattened, essentially, vector where it goes from x0 to xn if we have n plus 1 points and then the y-coordinate and z-coordinate if we're in 3D or just uh, the x and y's if we're in uh, 2D. Again, we need to define beyond, uh, these are just deltas on the uh, locations of the, orig of the original uh, B-spline control points. We need to define the domain and that means uh, the dimension, the spline order, the direction of the axes for the uh, B-spline control grid, where is the origin of that grid, what is the physical domain that this control grid occupies, and how many control points do we want on this. And then we can just create the uh, B-spline transform. After creating that B-spline transform, in this case we generate random values for those parameters, the deltas. How do we displace the control uh, point grid points? And then just set the, param set the parameters for that and we create another set of points here. These are the, uh, the original points are in blue under, underneath these triangles in red and then we scale the uh, uh, translations of the control point grids. And we can see what happens. As you can see, it's a relatively smooth and continuous motion, uh, which is a, an implicit uh, behavior of B splines, but uh, you can move the control points and generate uh, discontinuous and sh uh, where there is uh, where the uh, points are crossing over and uh, if you're dealing with uh, physical objects in the real world that means there is tearing and shearing that are not plausible. There is no, uh, these are admitted by B-spline transforms but they are uh, 
mitigated by their the natural uh, smoothness that is imposed by the uh, spacing between the uh, grid points. Now, another way of uh, defining the uh, B-spline transform is to use a set of coefficient images. So let's take a look just a second. Let me set this to some value here. And that, that is one val uh, we had one uh, B-spline transform defined here. And here I'm getting the parameters from that B-spline, creating images from them, X, Y, and Z. And in this case, excuse me, just X and Y, setting all the values here correctly. And then I create the B-spline second transform here with the coefficient images. Now I need to set the same uh, scale value as above. Otherwise, let's see, I'll set it to something else. And you can see these are not equivalent uh, transforms because their parameters are different. But here, if I set it to, uh, zero, to the same scaling of the parameters, then I can see that the uh, B spline one, the B spline and B spline two, the parameter values are exactly the same. So it's just two different ways of initializing a B spline transform. Finally, uh, we go to displacement field. That's a, a dense representation of a, a, a deformation. And in this case, again, I need to define a, the a physical a position and sampling of this deformation field. So the field size is 10 by 20. The origin is minus 1, minus 1. Spacing and direction of the field, those are uh, the axes, the two axes of the field. And I set the parameters, original displacement of the uh, associated with each of the vectors that is in the displacement field are randomly set. And we can look at that. And these, given that it's uh, they are randomly set. You can see there's no smoothness, no relationship between uh, uh, neighboring points because everything is, uh, it admits pretty much any random setting. So uh, harder to control for if you're working with uh, m images of uh, physical objects, you can end up with uh, shearing and tearing quite easily in this unless you impose some constraints on these transforms. Now, inverting bounded transforms, unlike with the global transforms where we have a get inverse method, with the uh, bounded transforms uh, for the B spline, we have no way of doing it uh, in a nice manner. With uh, a deformation field, we uh, have several ways of uh, inverting the deformation field. Uh, but for B-spline, we have a utility which takes any transform and creates a displacement field from it. So we will take a B we can take a B-spline, generate a corresponding uh, displacement field, and invert that displacement field. And that serves as our inverse for the B-spline. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. Now, the... Uh, how close this inverse is to the actual inverse really depends on what is the uh, fidelity of my uh, of the displacement field that I'm going to use. And in this case, uh, 0 0.1 millimeters. Every 0 0.1 millimeters, I'm going to uh, sample the uh, B spline, and that will serve as my original re representation of the B, uh, B spline transformation. And we'll see if that's good enough. And as you can see, the original transformation, the deformation tra uh, field transformation, those look pretty close to each other. So that, that's good enough. That means my uh, sampling there is dense enough for my purposes. But there is a difference, as you can see. And here I map uh, a point take an original point, 0 0.4 minus 0 0.2, and this is the result. So as you can see, the uh, inverse doesn't exactly get me back to the same point as uh, I uh, started with, and this is the difference. So this is only an approximation, this approach to inverting uh, the B-spline. 
but uh, unfortunately, not unfortunately, matter of factly, this is what we currently support in Simple ITK. Now, we, in addition to all these uh, various transformations, we have a composite transform, which is a utility function. So we can push multiple transformations into this uh, composite transform. And as the name says, it applies them one after the other. To If I give it a point, it will apply them one after the other. And in this case, I'll, we start with a global transformation. It's a translation. And uh, it's going to be 1, 0. And it's in 2D. And we have a displacement field in a portion of the uh, world, which has uh, an origin minus 1, minus 1. The field size is 10, 20. Spacing is given here. And the direction is the canonical axis, 1, 0, 0, 1. And we uh, set the displacement field where we create it here. Create another displacement field in another portion of the uh, of the uh, world, and concatenate that. Create that, and then we create a composite which combines the uh, two displacement fields and the translation. And we'll plot that together, and we can see uh, that this is these are regions where only the global transformation is happening and these two are regions where each of the display local displacement fields has a, an effect which is a combination of the global transformation and the local uh, displacement fields so that is composite transform and finally we have a, a generic transform the superclass for all transforms and it is what is returned when you read a transform from a file or when you uh, receive a transform back from registration. This is the generic type that you will get. Uh, but uh, once you have that as a generic type, you don't have access to the specific type functions. So in this case, I'm creating a translation transform and then I'm creating a generic transform from that translation. So we know this is a translation, but it's wrapped into the superclass. Now the translation itself has a get offset method, but once I uh, created the uh, anonymous transform type, in this case, the uh, I called it, uh, I, I've lost the access to that method. And as you can see that, the, if we run this cell, I get the generic transform does not have this method, but I can query it and ask get transform enum, and it tells me what type of transform is under the hood. And if I check, is it equal to a translation? And the answer is yes. And I can print, okay, I can convert, downcast it to the specific type, translation transform, get um, access again to the uh, get offset method. Finally, after we have all these transformations in memory for persistence, we need to write them and read them. And that's pretty simple. There's read and write transform. That's pretty much it. So we can create a, a transformation. We create a file name for it and write transform and just write it there. Read transform, we read, we'll read it back, and then we'll compare did the, is the transform that we have after reading, is it equivalent to the one that we wrote? And we can create a composite transform right, and write that to file and again read and see that those are equivalent. Now, uh, it is nice to see uh, what format these are written in, so we'll go to the command line and here we are, and as I said, we write our output to a, a specific directory. And here, let's peek at these transforms. And they're uh, essentially just text files with the information in there. You could edit them in any editor and then read them back in. Uh, let's see what the uh, composite transform looks like. And you can see that's much more complicated because it includes uh, displacement fields here and those are just a long bunch of numbers there. The Euler tra uh, 2D transform as you can see is much more concise, uh, much fewer parameters there. So 
let's return to our notebook. And now essentially we finished the basics of working with a uh, transforms in simple ITK. So let's continue and move over to images and resampling at the end, which combines images, transforms together. So as if you uh, did not uh, listen to the uh, previous chapter of our tutorial, uh, an image in simple ITK is a spatial object. It occupies a specific region in space, and that is defined by its origin, size, which is the number of pixels per dimension, spacing between these uh, pixels, and the direction cosine matrix, which defines the direction of the axes. And as you can see here, th this is how a simple ITK image is defined. If the, the origin is here, the image extent is half a pixel out. And same thing for the last uh, pixel, the image extent continues to the uh, half a pixel out here. Uh, spacing does not need, is not assumed to be isotropic, so you can have different spacing in X, Y, and Z. And uh, again, uh, the axes do not have to be orthogonal. So additionally, images may contain metadata. Uh, this is stored in a metadata dictionary, which we can access. We'll see how to do that later on. Image, when you create an image, you need to specify the pixel type, the dimensionality, and the rest, the origin, its position, its actual position and size and space, if you uh, are uh, essentially uh, have default values. If you, if you want to change them afterwards, you can do so, and we'll see how to do that later. Data transfer, as uh, you likely want to work both in Simple ITK and in other tools, you can get access to the uh, in, in pixel arrays uh, as NumPy arrays, and uh, you can uh, push NumPy arrays and create Simple ITK images using those. Again, uh, this is uh, just raising a common issue with resampling. We'll get to that a bit later. So let's start with what pixel types do does Simple ITK support? And there is a lot of them. What should be noted is that uh, there are scalar types and there are vector types. So uh, in Simple ITK and ITK, uh, there is no notion of uh, color spaces. So a three uh, a, a pixel type that is a vector of three components is not RGB or HSV or any other color space. It's just three components, and it is up to you, the user, uh, to know what color space they are in and convert them for display purposes. So uh, that is a, a subtlety that you should be aware of. Now you can move between the various pixel types using a cast function that uh, SimpleITK provides. Again, all data written to a dedicated directory. Do not contaminate your code uh, and data. Don't mix and match. Okay, we'll run that. And let's start by creating some images. And this will create, the first line here creates a 3D image with X, axis having 256, Y, Y 28, and Z 64. Notice again, the order is in simple ITK is X, Y, Z. In NumPy, it's Z, Y, X. So be aware that this is different. Uh, again, a, a 2D image here, 64 by 64, and the pixel type is float 32. And here, an RGB image, so it's 128 by 64, so it's a 2D image. It's a vector image with a uint8 as the pixel type for each entry, and we have three entries. So let's just create these images and view them uh, with Fiji. And they'll open. Okay, so we have our 2D image, which is 128 by 64, and we have our uh, 256 by 128 by 64 image. Again, by default, as I said, all uh, image entries are just set to zero. 
we can create, create, oh, it's more appropriate to say read an image just using read image. Not, not uh, very uh, surprising. And we can get an array view from that image for num as a NumPy array and use the standard matplotlib im show to view that image. And in our case, this is the old simple ITK logo. We just read it and display it as is. Some basic image attributes. Uh, as I said earlier, an image is defined as a spatial object, so it has origin, a size, that's the number of pixels per dimension, spacing, the spacing between these pixels, the direction of the axes, the pixel type, and the number of pixel components if it's a, a vector of, uh, uh, it's a multi-channel image. So, uh, and after we've created that image, we, uh, excuse me, after we write out the, uh, this information, we change the origin and the spacing. Essentially what we're changing is the physical size of that image. So let's see, and you can see the origin, we didn't change that, so that was uh, zero, 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 which was the default. And again, all everything is set to defaults. After modification, we just moved the image to some arbitrary point in space, and we changed essentially the pixel sizes. So it's anisotropic, starting from a isotropic 111, and it went to 0 0.5, 0 0.53, which is, uh, if you're coming from a medical imaging, well, that's pretty common in the CT world. So that would be your spacing. Now, we need to access these pixels. We'd like to actually see what values are in there. So we have a method getPixel. We have a method setPixel, where this would be which pixel. The first entries are which pixel, and this is what value to set. We can do that using Pythonic notation, which is probably nicer. So we just access the image at this location, set the value, and we're good to go. Uh, this is the recommended style. This is, you can use it, but it's uh, old school and matches if you were coming from the C++ ITK style of things. Uh, again, we can also paste an image into another in place. So in this case, we take the logo, where if you look here, we're using standard sli a Python slicing approach. So we're starting at 190, we'll go to 115, and we're going by minus one. So essentially we're flipping along the uh, X axis. We take the whole Y and we paste it back into the image. So let's see what we get from all these operations. So before printing, the value for the pixel was zero. Then we set it to one here. We print it, we get one. Here, a different pixel. Uh, set it to two, we get two, and finally we flipped that portion of the image and wrote it back onto the image, and instead of simple ITK, it's simple, and this is flipped, whatever that is right now. So, we can also use uh, the standard uh, Pythonic approach of sampling, so it's start at the beginning, go to the end, and take every second pixel in X and Y, and we can take a sub-image containing, in this case, the word simple. So start at zero, go to 115, and that's our sub-image. Here we do the same thing, but we're uh, starting at 115 and going to zero, and with minus one increments, so we're flipping the image. So let's just take a look at all these results. So the original, the image sampled every second pixel. You can see the aliasing that is happening here in the display due to the subsampling that way. And just selecting a subset, uh, subregion of the image and selecting it and flipping at the same time. Image operations. One of the things to note again is that SimpleITK, when you want to add or subtract or multiply pixels of two images, you're not working with uh, two arrays. You're working with objects that should occupy the same physical space. If they don't occupy the same physical space, you'll get an error. 
But let's start with two images that occupy the same physical space. We set some values here along the uh, width of the image. And we're able to add the two images here and display the result here. Now, the interesting thing is, but uh, image one was created by default and the default origin for uh, SimpliTK is zero, zero. Image two, we set the origin to some other value, which is not zero as you can see here, but it's close enough. Again, given that we're working with floating point numbers, everything is up to a uh, certain epsilon. And again, if I set, change the direction and make image two really different, I get an error and it tells me, okay, inputs do not occupy the same physical space. And it's the input, the difference is in the input direction. And it tells me, this is the tolerance that uh, it's checking that they're equivalent to. So I know what the error is and I know what uh, I should fix or uh, investigate what's going on with that. Let's uh, comment that again and in this case where it works again but let's play see what happens okay and this apparently is not good enough and we're breaking the tolerance when I change the origin so let's continue operations can also be done in place so image 1 plus equals image 2 actually modifies image 1 and again, we can see that by just running it. Oops, oh, obviously I forgot to change the, uh, the tolerance again so that it they actually do occupy the same physical space. And yep, and they do occupy the same physical space again. And I can change image one here. And we have other operations, for instance, a threshold image which uh, I'm saying image three, all the values that are greater than 50. And let's see what happens. And these would be uh, set to one. And this is set to one. And all the rest of the image is just zeros. So I get a binary image out of this using a arbitrary threshold, in this case 50, which matches the uh, two lines that were uh, plotted across the image. Now, as we said earlier, no toolkit is an island. We would like to work with our favorite uh, uh, Pythonic uh, deep learning frameworks, for instance, uh, PyTorch or Keras or TensorFlow, whichever you prefer. And the way to do that is via a NumPy. In SimpliTK, again, when you are trans trans when you are moving data from SimpliTK to NumPy or from NumPy to SimpliTK, be aware that the order of the axis is different. SimpliTK goes X, Y, Z. NumPy is Z, Y, X. So if you uh, encounter some problems when you're doing this, try to remember this from this tutorial, this point. So how do I get uh, the, uh, a copy of the array, a NumPy array from the image? I just call get array from image. If I do get array view, that's mem more memory efficient, but means that I have to maintain the SimpliTK image. If it goes out of scope, this view is uh, no longer valid. NumPy to SimpliTK, get image from array, and you give it a NumPy array, and uh, you're done. But uh, as we know, SimpliTK images occupy a spatial region, then you need to position and size that image because a SimpliTK image is not an array of values. It's more than that. So let's get the array here and, get, uh, and take a look at what we're working with. So in the image 3D, we have it's a 256 by 128 by 64. That's the SimPy DK. But the NumPy, as I said, this is X, Y, Z. In NumPy, it's Z, Y, X. Now, uh, this is an RGB image. It's a 2D image in SimPy DK with three channels. So uh, when I report the size of it, it's 128 by 64. 
But NumPy is, doesn't have the concept of channels. It's not working with an image. It's working with an array. So that 128 by 64 becomes 64 by 128 by 3. Okay, so now let's create an image here. Get a NumPy array view on that and see what we can see from that. So this is just a display of, this is a way of displaying a simple ITK image. Now, if I have a NumPy array that is Z, Y, X in this case, I need to uh, tell simple ITK, is this a 3D image or possibly this is a 2D image with a, a, a three channel uh, components here. So the way to do that is if I don't tell SimpliTK anything, it will assume this is just a 3D image, grayscale. But if I tell it, yes, this is, this is a vector image, then it will know, okay, this is 2D and this is, uh, these are the channels. So let's see what happens here. And as you can see, when it's a 3D image, then it's Z, X, Y, Z. And when it's a, a, a 2D image, we're getting the same, and we're, uh, we know that the last three components are just the three channels. Now, creating images in memory and uh, working with them is great, but we need persistence, so we need to write and read images. SimpliTK reads a large uh, set of uh, image formats, and it uh, deals with uh, single files or DICOM series, which come in multiple files. And we have both object-oriented approaches to reading them and uh, procedural approaches to reading things. We'll go into these in detail here. So let's just start by reading using the procedural interface, which is pretty trivial. Read image and write image. So uh, if you can see, I'm reading the simple IDK image as a JPEG and then I write it back as a PNG. So actually you could have a one line program that converts from uh, format A to format B pretty transparently. So, and that's that. And again, we can force the pixel type to be a specific type in simple ITK. So your image might have a vector of unsigned int and uh, one, one character unsigned int which is a standard representation for color images rgb images but uh, we can force it to unsigned 16 or float 64 or to whatever other format that we so desire it may be useful for some purposes it may not but uh, here we're displaying the images with matplotlib. Matplotlib has certain constraints on the uh, images it can display. So in this case, it's a standard RGB image. Then we'll convert it to unsigned int 16. I can convert it to float 64, but uh, matplotlib won't know what to do with this. As you can see, it has an error. It tells me. I can't show, I am show with RGB data. It, if it's float, it needs to be in zero one. And we've converted it to float 64, but we kept it in, in zero 256. It's still zero 256 in this case, but it's represented by an unsigned N 16 uh, bit. So again, uh, you can play with the actual type in simple ITK. Uh, more importantly, in the domain of uh, medical imaging, we need to read DICOM uh, series, and uh, these are how uh, volumetric images are represented by uh, in DICOM. So we can read this. We have the series uh, image series reader get GDCM series file names, and if we give it a series ID, if we know the ID in advance and a directory, it will return all a list of images that belong to that series. If you don't know what a series is or a study in DICOM, that's outside the scope of uh, the Simple ITK tutorial, but you should go and uh, brush up on DICOM and how to work with DICOM images in general. So, 
what this did was read a bunch of uh, images and then write the whole thing as a single volume 3d image dot MHA and let's just go peek and see if that was actually written 3d image dot MHA and we can see that this is pretty sizable it's a 283 megabyte image volumetric image so we can select a specific DICOM series from a directory that contains multiple series and here in this uh, function we uh, use a file reader and we use its ability to read just metadata information from an image without reading the bulk pixel data which is a, 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 a more complicated uh, and uh, time consuming operation so we will just read the metadata that is inside the uh, Im given image and extract these uh, values from it this allows us to have a, a nice oops and we get a nice uh, GUI here which allows us to select different series and as you can see the values here change this is uh, the patient name uh, acquired in 2014 it was an MR this is the date and in this case both these are a different series from the same study this is a CT patient name was test uh, was acquired at Children's National Medical Center and uh, again now we can read, we read the uh, DICOM volume and we get the Z slice that is in the middle. So that is for that series. Let's see if we change that. What can we get? Okay, so it's a different uh, MR scan. And last but not least, let's see what we get here. And again, we can see that it's getting the different series, reading the image, and then we can extract a single slice from that and display it here in the notebook. We could display uh, it in a variety of other ways, but more about that later. Finally, if I have a volume, I'd like to write it to disk. Now, uh, an interesting thing here is that these are high dynamic range images and I would like the, to save them in a low dynamic range format like JPEG or PNG and we have the utility that allows us to rescale the intensity and by default it takes the, the other uh, uh, intensities in the image and rescales them to, z to be between 0 and 255 and but those are still kept as floating point uh, values, the rescale intensity. So I cast those values to unsigned int 8-bit. And that is, the f that is the type that is appropriate for JPEG. And finally, I just write the whole thing, write image. It gets the volume. It receives a list of file names. And a single call to write image will generate all these uh, files. So let's go let's let it run and go see what was the result and and you can see it wrote all of these images it's a long large set of images but when I open it in the viewer I can see this is the rescaled intensity from that MR that we selected so now that we know how to write we have some advanced reading. So uh, in this case, I'm creating a file reader and I can set a specific image IO. I tell the reader, you're going to be reading using this. So it is going to be reading JPEG images in this case, and then setting which file to read and read it. Now, once I set the image IO to JPEG, the reader will only try to read the images as JPEG. So if I give the reader another image that is, in this case, a metadata format, it's a volume here, it should fail. So let's see what happens. 
and yes it was able to uh, read I printed in this case we start by printing the file reader when I print the reader it also tells me these are all the registered image IOs so if I tell the reader use one of these it will be able to uh, read that specific file format but what happened here is that it read the uh, JPEG but then after uh, I set it to read only JPEG it failed on reading the MHA so let's fix this and we will tell the reader here set image IO and it's meta but I don't remember the exact meta image IO let's set that and let's see and yes it was able to read the meta image IO and all is well but if I want to tell the reader read it read the image I don't want to tell you what format it is in or I don't know what format it is in or I want to read all formats simple ITK supports then if I never set this if I never called set image IO that's the default behavior but if I changed it in our case I changed it to JPEG let me uh, change it back again so that we can see that it fails here so it fails now if I set it like this it will succeed in reading uh, all formats and now it, and let's see and this is the data set that we read okay something a uh, more interesting is if I know that I only need a subset subregion of my image I can tell the reader and this depends on the file type again not all uh, image IOs support this but I can tell it read only a certain region I don't need to read everything in one go into memory if you're working with very large images possibly take a region inside the uh, central region of the image because that's usually where the data is uh, we try not to have our data at the edges of our images so we have a, a start and we have a start index and the extract size and that's the region that I want to read and in this case I'm going to read the same uh, volume but only a subregion from the center and let's read and it'll open and here it's loading and you can see that it's the same image but just a really cropped version of it and that is much more memory efficient if I have really large images find control over reading okay so now we've covered our transforms we've covered our images let's combine the two we can use resampling we can define a grid in the world a transformation that maps points from that grid onto an existing image and that image is resampled onto this grid now uh, we have a variety of interpolation methods that allow you to uh, evaluate the uh, uh, intensity values at uh, the resampled points but uh, usually you'll be using a uh, linear because it's a compromise between speed and accuracy it's good for most applications a uh, nearest neighbor is very useful when you're working with labeled images because you don't want to introduce values that didn't exist in the original label image a label image essentially represents a segmentation or some other discrete information about the pixels in the in an image so we have a procedural api and we have a, a uh, object-oriented API the resample image filter is the object-oriented API but usually uh, we use the uh, procedural API just because it's more concise and uh, there are three variants to it one just receives a single image 
and that image serves as both as the source as and the destination so this image defines both the grid and you also want to resample from it and then there's the transform which interpolation scheme to use and as I said by default we usually go for linear or nearest neighbor again if my image is a label image uh, option two I have image one this is the image I want to resample this image is just here to define a grid so this would be an image that is in this location in space and I want to resample this image onto this grid and finally if I don't want to use another image this is the image that I want to resample and I specify the grid po uh, component by component this is the sizes the number of uh, samples per axis the interpolator, the transform here, uh, the output origin, the, the, which is the grid origin, the uh, grid spacing, the grid direction, and default pixel value. If you don't set the pi default pixel value, these are zero. Uh, that, that's the value. But uh, let's say you're working uh, with CT, you would select probably minus 1,000, which is uh, the Hounsfield units for air which is probably what is outside the object that you're looking at. Now, let's take a look after uh, we do some resampling. Let's, this interface just allows me to apply a transformation and then I resample using that transformation. And as you can see, the resampled image is uh, going in the other direction from the uh, the transformation that I'm applying. Now, uh, an interesting thing is that uh, where, un where do I want to rotate? This is very specific to images. Usually, we expect to rotate around the center of the image. If we do not set the center, let's see what happens here. Let's not set the center. And you can see it's rotating around the origin, but that is probably not what you expect from a rotation when you're working with an image because you expect it to rotate around the center of the image and not the origin of the image. So again, you would set the, tra the center for the transformation and now we're rotating around the center of the image so the center of the transformation and the center of the image coincide okay so common errors with uh, when uh, doing resampling usually uh, your, set, your definition of the resampling grid is just incorrect. Something weird uh, in your uh, computations happened. This is not too common, but uh, something that is pretty common is that uh, you set a transformation, but your your setup is such that you should be actually using the inverse of the transformation that you provided. You do need to know what 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 is the direction that the transform that you have in hand is uh, in is it from the grid to the uh, image or is it from the image to the grid and that that second the grid could be another image which often it is so let's define the resampling grid and here again setting the center pretty important because uh, you want the rotations around uh, the center of the image but this looks pretty much like nothing happened and this is because what we're doing is we're transforming the point we're using we're setting the grid so that the transform maps the image back exactly onto itself. So uh, you really do need to know uh, what is the direction things are going in. And that pretty much completes our uh, in introduction uh, portion of the tutorial. So thanks for listening.